Heavenly Father, we come before you as always with prayerful, thankful hearts, thanking you for every good thing and for every blessing in Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for the blood of your Son <clears throat> that cleanses from all sin. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the eternal truth of your word and your spirit that leads us into all truth. Our prayer tonight, Lord God, is that you'd open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to your word, its glory, and its meaning, and that these things, Lord God, would impact our lives to be better servants and followers of you in Jesus. Amen. In Galatians, we're told that Abraham, who's the father of all who believed, had the gospel preached to him. He actually had the gospel preached to him. Well, how could somebody have had the gospel preached to him before Jesus died and rose, before the day of Pentecost? But we're actually told in the second and third chapters of Galatians, he had the gospel preached to him. And we're told it has something to do with the way God appeared to him in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, when God gave him five promises, including, in you shall all the people of the earth be blessed. However, we see something that's very interesting in the New Testament. There were things that were not specifically written in the Old Testament that Jewish people knew about and that God recognized they knew, even though it was not written in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 12, God appears to Abraham in a place called Haran. Haran. But when we read the book of Acts, when St. Stephen is about to be martyred, he tells us something else. We're told in Acts chapter 7 the following. Stephen gives his apology before he's martyred. He gives an account for his faith in Acts chapter 7 verse 2 before he's stoned to death. And he said, Hear me, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said, Depart from your country and your father's relatives. Well, that's not written in the book of Genesis. It's only written in the New Testament. But there were things that Jewish people knew that the New Testament tells us they knew that were not specifically written in the Old Testament, yet they are in the Word of God. We have things in the Apocrypha. The book of Enoch, the book of Maccabees. Those books are not canon. They're not a basis of doctrine. But they are biblically important in history and literature. The fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies is not found in Scripture. The fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies about Antiochus and so forth, things that teach about the Antichrist, they're written in the Apocrypha. We can never base doctrine on any truth not found in Scripture, but sometimes there's truth that is in Scripture, but you have to look at it the right way. We wouldn't know that God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia before Haran unless you read the New Testament. We wouldn't know how Daniel fulfilled, uh, saw these prophecies, these prophecies of Daniel would be fulfilled concerning Antiochus unless you read the history, unless you read the book, the book of Maccabees. So he has the gospel preached to him. And there's different ways it happens. One of the ways it happens is through the illustration of what happened to his son. In the book of Hebrews, we read that God told him to take his son Isaac and to prepare to offer him up on a sacrifice in, in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. He considered that God is able to raise men from the dead from which he also received him back as a type. Abraham had to give his own son in sacrifice and get him back because that's the picture of what Jesus would do. The way the gospel was preached in the Old Testament is the way it will be preached in the, in the millennial reign of Christ. In the Old Testament, it was preached through ritual symbolism, through ritual symbols, the sacrificial system of the Levites, or in the case here of Isaac. The blood of these animals in the Old Testament were pictures of the blood of Jesus. The Passover lamb is a picture of Christ, the lamb without spot or blemish. One man without sin is worth more than all the men with sin. The Yom Kippur scapegoat, the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. Jesus is the scapegoat for our sin. These animals are pictures of Jesus. Uh, we moved this for some reason. I don't know why we did, but I've got to get it back into operation. Sorry, I didn't notice.
the gospel was already being proclaimed through its shadows in the Old Testament. <clears throat> but somehow Abraham had a rather unique understanding of it. Abraham in Hebrew is called Jedidiah, Yedida, the friend of Yahweh. The friend of Yahweh. In the Old Testament, if a Jewish person under the law had real faith and real repentance, if they had a sincere faith and sincere repentance, the blood of these animals would be what we call A korban. A korban. And it would make something called kapora. The korban would make kapora. As in Yom Kippur. You've heard of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement? Jewish Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur. Whoops. This thing doesn't like me tonight. It, it didn't even want to show up. Korban would make kapora. The blood atonement would make kapora. The blood of these animals, if there was real faith and real repentance, would temporarily, temporarily cover the sin of the people until the Messiah came and removed them. It would be a temporary provision. It would make kapora. In the millennium, it's the same thing. How will people who do not know about sin in the sense that we do understand the gospel? There'll be people who'll be born in the millennium. They'll be like antediluvian man. They'll be the way people were before the flood. They'll live to be a thousand years old. If somebody dies at the age of 120, it will be considered a pediatric fatality. Well, how will they have the gospel preached to them? The same way, through the symbolism. The same as these symbols teach what the Messiah was going to do in the Old Testament, during the millennial reign of Christ, they will teach what he did do. We have the world, the flesh, and the devil. But in the millennium, Satan will be bound for a thousand years. The world won't be here, only the earth. The planet will be here in its uncorrupted state. So the flesh will have nothing to tempt it or incite it. The flesh can sin, be carried away by its own lust, but if there's no temptation, and there's no world, <laughs> there's no homotosphere, there's no sinful environment, these people will not have the same concept of sin as we have. It will be purely abstract. Hence, the way the gospel is explained to them will be through a reinstitution of a sacrificial system. That's what we read about in Ezekiel and Zechariah. In the Old Testament, these things were shadows of what the Messiah was going to do. In the New Testament, uh, in the millennium, there will be ways to teach what the Messiah did do. And so we see that Jews, and specifically Abraham, he had the gospel illustrated to him through the typology of his own son, putting his own beloved son on the altar and getting him back as a figure of Christ. But it's told were preached to him. It was preached, actually preached. Well, how could he have the gospel preached? And the word there is kerygma, the same as preaching the gospel in the book of Acts. How could he have it be preached? What I'd like to look at tonight is The Order of Melchizedek. The Order of Melchizedek. The Royal Priesthood. The Royal Priesthood. The name Melchizedek comes from two Hebrew words. Melek meaning king and tzaddik meaning righteous and he is the king of Salim which is the even today the Arabic word for peace but it is just a variation of the word 
Shalom. He's the king of Salem, Melchizedek. Let us understand the order of Melchizedek. Turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 14. Abraham, with the help of God, is able to rescue Lot from his captors and to defeat these other kings. He defeats all of them, and he's somehow even allied with the king of Sodom at this point, before the king of Sodom turns against his family. But in verse 17 of Genesis 14 we read, Then after his return from the defeat of Kedor Leomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. <clears throat> now he was a priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Abraham paid him a tithe of the booty he got from these ten pagan kings. He pays him a booty, a tithe of the booty, of the spoils. Well, why does Melchizedek give him bread and wine? Bread and wine, obviously, are what we call a suzerainty ritual. A suzerainty ritual. It is a covenant meal. A covenant meal. What is the Last Supper? It's a Passover Seder. What is the Passover Seder? It's a covenant meal. Well, it's a covenant meal. Well, this thing... Thank you. I wasn't around when they handed out brains. How did Jesus say we keep the memorial of the new covenant? Well, with bread and wine. So Melchizedek shows up and he has a covenant meal and he's called the king of righteousness, the king of peace, and he makes a covenant and he has, celebrates a covenant meal with Abraham. Obviously, there was dialogue between these two people. Other people understood the gospel through the types, through the symbols, through the shadows. Abraham had that with his son, but he also had something else. He had a face-to-face -face confrontation with someone. Now let's look to Psalm 110, please. Verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. The Lord will stretch forth thy strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people will volunteer freely in the day of thy power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, thy youth are to thee as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord said to my Lord, Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Notice the order of Melchizedek precedes the order of Aaron. It precedes the order of Aaron. We always interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of Christ. What does the New Testament tell us about these scriptures? In Hebrews chapter 1, we read this. It's speaking of the deity of Christ. Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee, that all the angels of God worship him. Then it goes on saying, verse 8, Thy throne, O God, is forever, 
and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. It goes on beyond that. And it tells us more and more, sit at my right hand, in verse uh, 12, until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet, in verse 13. Quite a situation. These verses and Psalms are explained in Hebrews. In fact, they are quoted from. What is it saying? The Lord said to my Lord, until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Well, Hebrews 1 is arguing for the divinity of Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 is probably the easiest chapter to confuse the Jehovah's Witness with. Okay, it's probably the easiest. Not the only, but the easiest. Well, it explains Psalm 110. It explains that Jesus is God. And he's a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, Melchizedek is what we would call a Christophany. A Christophany. Whenever Jesus appears in a carnate form in the Old Testament, it is called a Christophany. The most common Christophany is the angel of the Lord. Hamal Akadonai, the angel that wrestled with Jacob. That's the most common way Jesus appeared, but not the only way. Whenever God appears in a carnate form, it's never the Father or never the Holy Spirit, always Jesus. When Adam heard God walking in the garden, that was the Lord Jesus. Okay. When Joshua saw the commander of the hosts, that was Jesus. When Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, the Metatron, that was Jesus. But we're told when we look at Psalm 110 and Genesis 14 in light of Hebrews 1, that Melchizedek is a Christophany. He is an Old Testament enfleshment of Jesus. Nobody can see God and live. So when anybody saw God in the Old Testament, they had to see God in some human way. These are called Christophanies. Abraham met Jesus. And if you come with us to Israel in April, I'll bring you to one of the places. Abraham walked with, walk with the Lord. I will bring you to Elon Moray. Donna's been there. So he met Jesus in a face-to-face relationship. But there's something about this, Melchizedek. Under the law of Moses, a king had to be a descendant of David. A king was Davidic. A king was Davidic. A high priest, or a priest, any priest, but especially the high priest, was Aaronic. The king was from the tribe of Judah. The priests were from the tribe of Levi. A king could not be a priest, nor a priest a king. When one king tried to function as a priest and burn incense in the temple, God smote him with leprosy. In the Hasmonean period, in the intertestamental period, there was a king called John Hudakonis, who was actually the high priest, but he shouldn't have been that. In other words, even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, you had a kind of separation of church and state. Even in the Old Testament under the Levitical legislation, there was a separation of church and state. Now, some people misunderstand or overlook this. We are told, for instance, that, and I've seen this, when ministers or pastors go into serious immorality, and it becomes publicly known, well, they can be restored to ministry. Well, wait a minute, the the New Testament says they must be beyond reproach. Yes, but look at what happened with David. David didn't have to be restored to ministry. One, he was not in the ministry. (laughs) He was a king, not a Levite. (laughs) Wrong tribe, wrong job. (laughs) Secondly, he was never removed from being king to begin with. (laughs) How could he be restored to an office he was never removed from? They're confusing two different things. They're confusing the Davidic with the Aaronic. That's their first problem. Second problem is we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New. 
unless your righteousness exceeds that. Uh, you must be beyond reproach. Somebody in ministry who goes into some serious sin or immorality or something like this and it becomes known, they can be restored to fellowship, but they cannot be restored to leadership. They can be restored to fellowship, but they cannot be restored to leadership. There was a separation of church and state even in the Old Testament. However, notice something. The separation between church and state was institutional. It was not theological or moral. They had the same juridical, ritualistic, and moral constitution. So the idea of separation of church and state, it was institutional separation. It was not a constitutional separation. <laughs> in the United States and in Great Britain, the founders of democracy in the English-speaking world, the Puritans in England, for all their mistakes, they understood the only way that democracy would work is if we were governed by men who were governed by God. Parliamentary democracy was based on the biblical principle that we must be a nation of laws, not of men. The founding fathers of America said the same thing. Presidential democracy in America said the same thing. The only way democracy can work is if we're governed by men who are governed by God, that man's laws must be based on God's laws. And somebody once said, thanks to Congress, we have 13 million laws to explain Ten Commandments. Well, now think of this. Just think of this. Uh, it gets more and more crazy. You know, th there's nearly 70,000 pages in the U.S. IRS tax code. <laughs> Find me a businessman in the United States <laughs> who, who knows the whole tax code. The only people who know the whole tax code are a handful of very highly paid tax lawyers and accountants in New York and Chicago who, who, who some extraordinarily wealthy people can maybe hire. <laughs> but the average businessman, even the average successful businessman, wouldn't have a clue. How can you understand 70,000 complicated... This is crazy. This is nuts. Well, that's what happens when you remove God from the equation. Everything goes nuts. It's very sad. It's very sad. I'm only stating facts. Um, when Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed by Ronald Reagan to the Supreme Court, she wrote the decision ordering the Ten Commandments out of the Judicial Building. First, you know, one of Mr. Eisenhower's Supreme Court Justices ordered God out of the classroom. Then one of Mr. Nixon's Supreme Court Chief Justices ordered God out of the maternity ward, with Roe v. Wade. And then one of Mr. Reagan's Chief Justice has ordered God out of the courtroom. You take God out of the equation. Separation of church and state was never intended to mean that. Anybody reading the U.S. Constitution would say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all monarchs, the Declaration of Independence and Constitution are both theistic documents. They're both predicated on the presupposition that there's a God, and they obviously believe that God to be the Judeo-Christian God, the God of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. That was their belief. Separation of church and state never meant anything but that. The only thing separation of church and state meant was Congress shall not pass a law with respect to the establishment of a religion. They did not want the state church. Over there you have some Lutherans. Well, in Germany that's called the Staatenkirk, the state church. In England we have the Church of England. In Scotland we have the Presbyterians. These are the state churches. In Italy it's the Catholic Church. Well, the only thing they believed is we should not have a state church. It's up to your own conscience what church you go to. That's all it ever meant. Nobody reading what these guys actually wrote, whatever... Somehow, the courts have redefined separation of church and state. When in fact, the founding fathers of America and Britain only meant what was already in the scripture. There would be an institutional separation of church and state. Now, under this, it would be like this. A king could not be a priest. A priest could not be a king. There'd be no royal priesthood. Only the Messiah and the Messiah alone had a right to be king and priest. I pointed out once before here in Cedar Rapids that when Jesus went to the cross to take our sin, Pilate put the sign on the cross. 
Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. He was the high priest making atonement on the altar for our sin. The cross is a picture of the altar, the picture of the cross. He was the high priest making atonement, yet he was called king. Now, although he was a king, he was functioning as a priest. Notice he functions as a priest before he functions as a king. But only Christ could be both king, high, a king, and high priest. In Jesus, we're all kings and we're all priests. Only he is the high priest, and he is the Melech Hamlachim, the king of kings. In the millennial reign of Christ, we'll all be priests, and we'll all be kings. But he will be the high priest, and he will be the king of kings. This ironic order came later. The original order was that the king, the government, and the priesthood, the clergy, were the same. And will be again. Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6, For to us will be born a child, will be born a son, will be given. The government will be on his shoulders. His name will be called Pelio Etz, El Gabor, Adi Ad, and Sar Shalom. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Another verse that causes Jehovah's Witnesses problems. There will be no end to the increase of his government or his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. Once more, our high priest will also be our king. So in other words, God's original plan was for theocracy. In the millennium, there'll be theocracy. Something has happened in between the fall of man and the return of Jesus to set up his kingdom. This is the background to what we're going to look at now. Turn with me, please to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. Hebrews, chapter 5, the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 5, verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracle of God. You've come to need milk, not meat. Now Hebrews was obviously written to Hebrews. It was written to Jewish believers. But the author of Hebrews, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is lamenting the fact, he's lamenting the fact, that look, as Jews, you guys should know this stuff. You should understand about Melchizedek, but you don't. You don't even know basic doctrine. Melchizedek is messianic typology. It's meat. It's heavy Old Testament teaching showing how it's fulfilled in Christ. Remember, you only have a baby food understanding of the New Testament unless you understand the New Testament in light of the Old. It's like this. Say somebody is a paramedic. A paramedic only has to know how to keep somebody alive who's a trauma victim or has a coronary or something. He only has to know how to do basic things to get somebody alive to an emergency room, to a surgical theater. That's all. They only need hands-on. He doesn't have to know anything if somebody has a heart attack other than how to defibrillate and oxygenate. That's all they have to know is CPR, defibrillation. That's all they have to know to keep somebody alive until they get him to a hospital. That's all. Well, thank God for paramedics. They save a lot of lives. But if a paramedic decided, gee, you know, I like this, and I really have a good aptitude for it, I think I'm going to go back and study medicine. Now, 
It's not so easy. Now they have to study biochemistry, microbiology, physiology, pharmacology. They have to study all these other things. Gee, when I was a paramedic and somebody was hemorrhaging from an accident, a trauma victim, all we had to do was tourniquet them and get them to the hospital. But now I have to learn about how a protein called prothrombinase is synthesized to make prothrombin that causes blood to clot. And that works by firing electrons from the shell of one atom to... Wait a minute, this is complicated. <laughs> All you have to learn is first aid to be a paramedic. But now... <laughs> You have to know a lot more than first aid if you want to study medicine or dentistry. Somebody was a policeman. And he said, you know, law enforcement's interesting. I find law really an interesting field. I think I'm going to go back to university. And I'm going to go to law school. <laughs> well, now he's gone back to law school. And he's learning malum and say. And he's learning with mens rea and without mens rea. What am I learning Latin for? I didn't have to learn Latin when I was walking the beat or driving in the police car on the, on the interstate. I didn't have to learn the difference between prima facie evidence and circumstantial evidence. I didn't have to learn the difference between corroboration and mitigation. I didn't know. And look at all these books, there's thousands of them. And the laws vary from one state to one state, and then there's all the federal law, and the, oh boy, this is crazy. You know, well, you want to be a lawyer, don't you? There's nothing wrong with being a policeman. They save a lot of lives. They do important things. But uh, policemen, unless they're FBI agents, they're not lawyers. If he decides he wants to be a lawyer or a prosecutor, he's going to have to go back and learn it on a whole other level. Well, if that's law, that's medicine. Somebody can be uh, an electrician, can be a pretty good electrician, wiring houses, wiring buildings, can put in circuits, he can do all kinds of things. But he says, you know, uh, you know, I like this. I find electricity fascinating. I think I'm going to go to college and study electrical engineering. <laughs> but when he gets to college, he finds out they don't begin teaching him electrical engineering. He finds out they begin teaching him electrophysics. <laughs> Well, Christianity is no different. All you need is the hand to be a cop or a paramedic or an electrician. All you need is the hand to be a baby Christian. But if you really want to get into it, you've got to learn the shadow. How did the hand get there? How did these laws come about? How does electricity come from metals and from the motion of electrons? How does this blood come about the clot? What is hemoglobin? How are these things synthesized from iron? If you don't know the shadow, you'll only know the substance on a superficial level. Yeah, it'll tell you how to get saved. It'll tell you how to live a moral life. That's what milk will do. But you're never going to grow into the meat. The Lord wants disciples, not converts. He doesn't want ordinary cops. He wants FBI agents. He doesn't want paramedics. He wants physicians. He doesn't want electricians. He wants electrical engineers. And that's what is being complained about in Hebrews. And it uses the issue of the order of Melchizedek to drive the point. I want to tell you about Melchizedek, but this stuff is meat. You guys are on milk. You're on baby food. That's all you were ever taught. Let's look. Let's continue. Next chapter, Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 20, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
For this Melchizedek in chapter 7 verse 1, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham also apportioned the tithe, the tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father or mother, in other words, he's eternally existent, he was pre-existent, having neither beginning or end of life, but made like the Son of God, he abides a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law, the Torah, to collect the tithe from the people, that is, from their brethren, although they, there are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abram, Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And in this case, Mortal men receive tithes, but in the case one receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. In other words, everybody, the entire Jewish race was in Abraham genetically, the entire human race was in Adam gene genetically. This is God's thinking. There's only two men. There's only two men. When you're born of the flesh, you're born of Abraham. When you're born again, you're born of Christ. There's only two generic men in God's economy. In first birth, you were born of your son of Adam. In second birth, you're son of God. There's only two men in God's economy. You're either one or of the other. There's only two men. The first Adam and the last Adam. So it goes. Story continues. So to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the Torah, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? Notice there are two priesthoods juxtaposed against each other. The older one is the order of Melchizedek, the second one, later one, is the order of Aaron. Melchizedek's priesthood preceded Aaron's. Okay. Then it goes on. For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also, from the old to the new covenant. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. Priests were from the tribe of Levi. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of law, of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of former commandment because of the weakness and uselessness, for the Torah made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, Thou art a priest forever." So much more that Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. And the former priests, on one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession. It compares these two priesthoods. Now, doesn't that sound elongated, complicated, and boring? Well, so is organic chemistry. But if you don't learn organic chemistry, you will never learn biochemistry. If you don't learn the biochemistry, you'll never learn the physiology, and you'll never be a dentist, and your mother will be very upset. Now, you want to be a dental nurse? That's okay. 
If you want to be a dentist, you got to go through this. It's like anything else. That's what it's saying. Two orders. Once more, we have the ironic, and we have the Melchizedek. What are the differences? First difference. The ironic singularity. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, in life of priests in life of high priest only one high priest at a time in Melchizedek the singularity is eternal in other words they don't die they just keep going secondly the ironic you have covenantal inferiority. In the order of Melchizedek, we have covenantal superiority. In the ironic, you have a situation where it is tribal and human. In Melchizedek, it is divine in the ironic it's non theocratic it's not the government had to be separate in Melchizedek it's different it is regal a royal priesthood. In the ironic order, to be one high priest in the life of that high priest, once he died, they get another one. Melchizedek just keeps going because he's Christ. One has an inferior covenant, the other has a superior covenant. One is a divinely ordained human institution based on tribe, that is birth. In Melchizedek, it is divine. One is non-theocratic, the other is regal. It's theocratic. The government will be on his shoulders. That's the difference between the two covenants. Well, that's all very interesting. But what does it mean to us? What does it mean to us that there is now a royal priesthood? Turn with me, please to 1 Peter chapter 2. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, in verse 9, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God, and you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
Peter, like Hebrews, was written to Jewish believers in the first century. It applies to other people, but you have to understand what it meant for the people who were reading it. We are now a royal priesthood. Something has happened. There's been a change of law, a change of covenant. Now we're all kings. Now we are all priests in Christ. That's what it's saying. When the Lord Jesus appears in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, He's wearing a combination of royal and priestly colors. You see the priestly colors from the book of Leviticus, but then you see the blue and the royal colors that David had and so forth. Why? And Solomon. Why? Only the Messiah could be both king and priest. It's a royal priesthood now. The government will be upon his shoulders. Will be. Now again, what does all this mean for us? Well, that's how you synthesize prothrombin, but what does it mean when somebody's hemorrhaging? The previous chapter, remember there's no chapter divisions in the Greek text. Verse 23, you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. A high priest had to be a high priest tribally. He had to be born into the tribe of Levi, a descendant of Aaron, through the line of Zadok. He had to be born a Hebrew of the tribe of Levi, a descendant of Aaron, and through the line of Zadok. And it could only be one of them. You could only be high priest, only be a priest by birth. The Levitical priest could only be a priest by birth. That's all. Only by birth. The king the same, he had to come from the tribe, he had to be a Hebrew, the tribe of Judah, a descendant of King David, and not through the line of Jeconiah. Um, you had to be born into it. How come we can be kings and priests? Because we are born again into it. It's only by birth. Now think of Prince Charles in England. I live in England when I'm not living out of a suitcase. I live out of a suitcase, but when I'm not doing that, I'm in England. He did nothing to become king or heir to the throne of Great Britain. Nothing. He was just born. He didn't earn it. He didn't merit it. He was just born of the right lineage. He had nothing to do with his being the heir to the throne. He just is by birth. He had nothing to do with it. Why are we going to heaven? Why will we co-reign with Christ in the millennium and in eternity? Why will we be a royal priesthood, both in the millennial reign of Christ, co-reigning with Him in His millennial reign on the earth, and then in all eternity? What did we do to earn it? Nothing. We were just born again into it. It's by birth. It's by second birth. The only thing is this. Understand what it's saying here about human government. He goes on and he talks about these things, but he says in verse 13 of 1 Peter 2, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right, etc. Think of Jesus. He was the king of the Jews. He was the king of kings. But he did not raise his hand or his voice against Caesar. That's coming with his second coming. He'll destroy the governments of this world in his second coming, not his first. The real king came, and instead of saying, I'm the king, get out of my way, Pilate. Go tell Caesar I said so. He didn't function as the king first. He functioned as a priest. How does God train to reign? He trains us to reign by presenting ourselves in the office of a priest first. Well, what do the priests do? They bring sacrifices. What sacrifice do we bring? Present yourself as a living sacrifice. What did Jesus do? He presented himself as a living sacrifice. He learned the ways of his father by suffering. And he had no sin. He didn't even have to suffer. He did it for our sake. Well, 
the thing about the kings, about Caesar, about Pilate, about governors, about prime ministers or presidents or chancellors is this. Any human king, his reign ends with his death. Our reign begins with our death. Their reign is temporal. They are like the order of Aaron. They have an inferior covenant. They're under an inferior constitution, an inferior legislation. Ours is superior. For them, it is not eternal. The singularity only lasts their lifetime. But in the order of Melchizedek, not only he shall reign forever and ever, we shall reign forever and ever. For the kings of this world, for the rulers of governments, nations, corporations, NGOs, trusts in the Cayman Islands, it ends when they give up the ghost. For us, it begins when we give up the ghost. Where life ends for them, it begins for us. That's quite a thing. Now notice, the king is born into it. We're born again into it. We did nothing to earn it. We did nothing to earn our crown, nothing to earn our status as kings, other than second birth. It was something God did. He just, Prince Charles is the Prince of Wales, he was born into it, we're born again into it. It's nothing to do with us as such. It's quite a thing. But then it goes on. Because these things are true, because we're in this new order, we have to live like our high priest, Melchizedek. He was the priest of righteousness. And so we're told in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you're a royal priesthood. We're then told, verse 11, Behold, I urge you, as aliens and strangers, to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that they, the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, of course, then, all the believers, at least nearly all the believers, when this was written, were still Jewish. There were very few non-Jews who believed at this point. Gentiles, in the context, would basically mean unbelievers. Okay? Well, just look at it today. You know, I, I, it's important to keep our political views separate from our Christian views, but I read an editorial this morning in the newspaper at the airport and. In, in Pittsburgh on my way here to Cedar Rapids. The left-wing journalists and editorialists that were attacking Sarah, what were they attacking her for? I read this guy, this Reg Henry, for her faith. I watched on the news last night, they, they, they were going to her church and they, they're trying to pick her apart. Notice they're attacking her for her faith and for her moral living. <laughs> and what does it say? We'll give these heathen nothing to say about you. If they can find something on us, they'll use it. <laughs> See, their hope is in this world. Their hope is in... Why, why are they so desperate to get elected? Because it's all they're ever going to get. <laughs> Even if Sarah loses, she's still going to win. She's still going to reign forever. She may be the first woman president. Personally, I'd like to see it, but that's only my view. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Who cares? One thing's for sure. She follows Jesus... She's going to be a lot more than a human president who's against abortion. There won't be any abortion in the millennium. So therefore, what did Jesus do although he was a king? He didn't function as a king until he functioned as a priest. Yeah, the sign was on the cross, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. He was a royal priesthood. There was Melchizedek up there. Gave the covenant with the bread and wine. That was him. But he didn't take his crown. He took his cross. He learned obedience by suffering to death on the death to this world as an example to us and to empower us. Now, of course, it wasn't necessary for him because he was God and he had no sin, but it was necessary for us that he do it. 
It was not necessary for him to do it, but it was necessary for us that he did it. Okay. Well, if that's what he did, what are we told? Cling to the old rugged cross, exchange it one day for a crown. That's what it all comes down to. You want to be a king? First be a priest. You want to reign with him? Pick up your cross and follow him. Crucify the old nature. Live a godly life in this fallen world. These other kings, the rulers of human governments and the institutions of man, yeah, don't rebel against them. But remember, their reign ends with them. <laughs> However, it is not only the royal. It is the clerical, the clergy. It's completely unbiblical for a king to be a priest or a priest to be a king under the law. Likewise, there is render to Caesar what is Caesar, to God what is God's. Jesus never, ever, ever tried to establish a theocratic kingdom in his first coming. He simply says believers should be salt and light within this world until he does come. We should influence what exists with his principles. However, there is somebody who claims to be a priest in the order of Christ, who's also a human ruler. We don't think of the Vatican as a country, but that's what it is. It's recognized by the United Nations as a country. It's an independent nation. It is, in fact, the successor, what is, it's the remnant of what had been the Papal States, Central Italy, for centuries. And the Pope is there, and he is both a autocratic imperial king in the character of the emperors, yet he is, as it were, their high priest. It's amazing. When a pope dies, I remember when Pope John Paul II died, I, I read in the newspaper what happens. They, the Swiss guards, the, the, the papal guards, they seal off his chambers with a golden chain, and they close the doors and they seal it off, and then the Cardinal Secretary of State of the Vatican comes and pounds on the door three times. And he doesn't say, John Paul, do you live? He says, Carol Rojtila, do you live? He doesn't call him by his papal name. He calls him by his given name. <laughs> In other words, his status as Pope ends with his death. Even the Catholic Church acknowledges that. His status as a religious high priest ends with his biological death. His status as the monarch of the Vatican ends with his biological death. Where it ends for him, it begins for us. The only exception will be if Christ returns first. But it doesn't particularly matter if he comes, if Christ comes or if he comes for us, either way. It's six of one, half dozen of the other. Where it ends for them, it begins for us. Where it begins for them, it ends for us. Our hope is not in this world. Where it ends for us. Present yourself as a living sacrifice, it says. How should we live? Train to reign. What did Christ do when he came as king? Did he put down the Romans? Did he get rid of the Sanhedrin? No, 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 no. That's his purpose in his second coming. That's when he comes back with the crown. First he came with the cross. First he's the high priest. Presents the sacrifice. Then the government will be upon his shoulder. Instead of the cross on his shoulder, it will be the government. The dominion. For us it's the same. Right now, we carry a cross. When Jesus comes back, it won't be a cross anymore. Cling to the old rugged cross, we exchange it one day for a crown. And he goes on talking now about this royal priesthood. Verse 21, you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. To follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. 
While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds we are healed, etc. You were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd, to the guardian of your souls. Be like Christ. Yes, he was a king, but first he came as a priest. Although he had no sin, he took ours. Although he did not have to suffer, it was necessary for us that he did. He uttered no threats. He didn't return evil for evil. He just entrusted himself to God. This day is coming. And one of the things I have appreciated about Sister Sarah, if people were saying half that stuff about me, <laughs> I, know, I know what I'd want to say about them. But she's not doing that. May God give her grace to behave in a Christian manner in that situation. You know, uh, he's a Catholic, but and I hope he gets saved, but there was a guy I voted for named Alan Keyes. He's, he's, he's from Illinois, and he's a Catholic, but it's hard. He, when he, he speaks, it's almost he, you're like you're talking to a believer. I'm sure the guy, if somebody... He's one of those guys that I would just want to sit down to and witness to him, because I'm 99% sure he'd get saved. You know, but what happened? Because he, he, he was godly. <laughs> they just massacred him. Well, we're told that. The world's going to massacre you. The world's going to massacre us. They're going to treat you the way they treated Jesus. What did they treat Jesus like? They treated the king of kings like he's a piece of garbage. Well, if they treated, I'll say, if they treated the king of kings, if they treated Melchizedek like a piece of garbage, and we've joined the order of Melchizedek, or we've been born again into the order of Melchizedek, what's the world going to treat us like? They're going to treat us like garbage. They're going to do to us what they did to Jesus. You'll have tribulation in the world. But where is Caesar now? Where is Pilate now? Where is Herod now? Where is Hitler now? Where is Stalin now? Where is Kim il Sun now? Where is Idi Amin now? It doesn't matter. They can even deify themselves in their own mind. Where are they now? It ended with their death. For ours, it ended with the death of Christ. The end precedes the beginning. The order of Melchizedek preceded the order of Aaron. For us, the end comes before the beginning. For them, the beginning comes before the end. Where it ends for them, it begins for us. Such it is. Such is the order of Melchizedek. We have a much, much better birthright. A much better covenant. Ours won't end. Ours is eternal. Ours is something that we were born into. No man gave it. No man can take it away. It's not non-theocratic. When Christ comes, it will be regal. It's not human. It's divine. It's not based on an inferior covenant like a constitution. Or the law is based on a superior covenant. It's not one that ends with death. It's one that begins there. The order of Aaron served a certain purpose for a certain time. But it was only there to teach us about a better purpose and a better time. That time is coming. A priest's life is not easy. But it will soon be over. <laughs> then we will live like kings. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We 
can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.